Marnie Hughes-Warrington here, Deputy Vice-Chancellor Research and Enterprise from the University of South Australia, and a very warm Nina Mani, which means how you're going and welcome. And what I want to do is to welcome you all very warmly to our alumni webinar on, and which we're going to hear from international property experts on the future post-COVID world of property. So I'm Marnie, I've introduced myself and it's important for me to also acknowledge that uh, the University of South Australia is on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and we recognise and respect their cultural heritage, their beliefs and their relationship with the land and we acknowledge that they're of continuing importance to Ghana people today. Uh, this, is, uh, this webinar is one of our ways of reaching out and staying connected with our alumni community, not just in Australia and in South Australia, but internationally. And so a very warm welcome to you, whether you're coming to us locally in South Australia, via Australia or internationally. People aren't able to get on planes at the moment, but they certainly are able to zoom into webinars. And it's fantastic that you're all joining us. In terms of housekeeping for today, I just want to explain a bit about the format for our webinar and some general housekeeping. The first is that the webinar will be recorded, but the recording will only record our speakers. The recording will not show your participant questions or the chat contributions that you make. Each panel member is going to speak on the topic and then we're going to ask them some questions and some of the questions that have come in, you submitted, those are the ones that we're going to start with. If you want to submit a question, can we ask that you do so through the Q&A function and you'll find the Q&A bottom at the bottom of your screen. I'm familiar that some of you will know Zoom very, very well. Some of you will have used other products, but hopefully you'll have a look around the screen and you'll be able to see that Q&A button down the bottom of your screen. And if you want to ask a question, please do use that function. Please note that we won't be using the raise your hand function, which comes up through the participants uh, menu, uh, as we do want to actually manage and make sure that people who do ask questions get those questions through. And we'll try to get through as many questions as we can, time permitting. Now, it's my great pleasure, uh, 130 days into the job, and what a great way to start a job and an association with the University of South Australia to introduce my three panellists. I'm gonna talk about them each individually, but I just thought I'd note panellists that I believe you all have in common that you were taught by Peter Rossini, AKA Wombat. And so, yes, there we go. And so yes. before I introduce them, I just wanna say a warm greeting to Peter if he's listening in and to acknowledge his contribution to the teaching of uh, our superstars here today. I'll start with Andrew Pridham, AO. Uh, Andrew's got over 30 years experience in investment banking, having held senior positions at UBS, where he was the head of investment banking Australasia and global head of real estate and at JP Morgan as executive chairman, investment banking Australasia. In 2009, he co-funded Wellis Australia and he's got great branding behind him to show you that. And today it has offices in Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, Shanghai and Beijing. Over the past decade, it's been involved in many of Australia's largest corporate transactions and has an excess of $5 billion under assets, under management across real estate, credit, venture capital, and private equity. Andrew has been a director of the Sydney Swan since 2002 and its chairman since 2013. In 2019, the Australia Day Honours, Andrew was made an Officer of the Order of Australia, for which congratulations for his distinguished service to investment banking and asset management, as well as to sporting groups and to philanthropy. So a very warm welcome to you, Andrew. Raised in Adelaide, he's an alumnus of the University of South Australia. I go now to Mike Starnett, who's the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of Stockland. Mark's 27 years of experience in property and financial services, including eight years in direct property, primarily with Jones Lang LaSalle and 10 years in listed real estate with UBS. Mark was appointed as head of Australasian equities at UBS in 2004 and as global head of research in New York in late 2005. In 2012, he was appointed as global head of product development and management for global asset management at UBS, a $559 billion global fund manager. Mark is a member of the Stockland Sustainability Committee, director of Stockland Capital Partners Limited and responsible entity for Stockland's unlisted property funds. He's the immediate past president and current director of the Property Council of Australia and also served as a director of the Green Building Council of Australia until the 30th of June, 2016. And then last but not least, Michael, welcome Michael. He's the regional chief executive officer Europe and Australia of Maple Tree, a USA of Maple Tree. Prior to joining Maple Tree, Michael was a partner at Goldman Sachs, heading the Southeast Asia investment banking business, as well as the bank's Asia Pacific, ex-Japan real estate business. As one of the pioneers of the Asian REIT industry, Michael has been involved in numerous initial public offerings, IPO, 
Coast Reitz. He's 25 years of investment banking experience and prior to Goldman Sachs, he was head of Asia X Japan Real Estate Investment Banking of UBS from 2000 to 2006. We're delighted to have Andrew, Mark and Michael on the panel today. And I know they'll be able to provide great insight to all of us into the priorities for South Australia and the wider world as we take the next steps to recovery at this uncertain and really challenging set of times. So Andrew, I'm going to hand over to you now to share your thoughts and insights. So welcome. Thanks, Sarah. And uh, thank you everyone for taking time uh, to be on this, uh, on this webinar. It's my first ever webinar, so excuse me for being um, terrible. But uh, with, with that build up, I thought I, I would start just focusing on what creates value uh, in real estate. It's, it, it might sound a very simple question, but I think it's, it's pretty important to framing discussion of where we are in the world and where we're heading and what creates fact what, what creates value is a, a complex web of um, things that occur in, in, in the, the, our world in the economy um, and they can be things such as politically and political and regulatory uh, factors uh, things such as the foreign investment review board taxes building codes uh, and even COVID-19 rules. Um, some of these political and regulatory factors have a direct impact on, on real estate values, and that can be things such as planning and, and building codes and zoning. Um, but many, there are many more that have indirect implications on, uh, on real estate uh, values and, and performance, and that can be things such as changing consumer behaviour um, or, or, or other factors that, that impact the economy, such as migration numbers taxes, all those sorts of things. So there's a whole lot of uh, political and regulatory uh, factors that, that impact real estate values. Technology. Technology is clearly something that, in, certainly in the last uh, 20 years, um, has been a, a big uh, factor in, in changing uh, the value of real estate. And we've seen that uh, in a whole lot of areas, such as the impact of, of online shopping on uh, shopping centres, uh, the, uh, the, the impacts of uh, uh, things such as Zoom meetings on office space, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, at some, at some point today. But technology has been affecting real estate values uh, for as long as real estate has been around. And if you, if you can think back, Mark Steiner will know this um, from his days as a boy, uh, that every, every town on the main street had a blacksmith shop. Um, <laughs> And that, and that blacksmith would, would obviously service a thriving trade of people having horses, uh, either for transport or, or to plough their fields. And obviously, over time, cars have come in and changed the change that. So there's no longer blacksmith shops. So if you own a blacksmith shop in a country town, um, the internal rate of return uh, probably hasn't been that good. Um, it's now being replaced by you know, whether it's service stations or other things. So technology, uh, its impact on, on Real estate value is not a new thing; it's been happening happening forever. Another important thing is is social and cultural um, changes that occur, and, and this can be many factors. We've seen after World War II, we saw huge migration in Australia from from Europe, for example, had a big impact on um, on how how cities worked and how people inter interacted with uh, restaurants and all sorts of other things. Uh, we've seen in, in, uh, with with the rise of Asian immigration, for example. We've seen the creation of Chinatowns in all of our capital cities, which have in, had impacts on real estate values. We've seen changes in people's religious um, activities where, uh, again, 100, 100 years ago when the blacksmiths were out and about, uh, the Catholic Church was, was building churches on the highest hill in every suburb in Australia. Well, that's no, no longer the case. Um, and so there's, there's changes in, 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 cult, in culture, changes real estate values. Um, and then another thing on this one was on major shocks, given, given the impact of COVID-19, major, major shocks have a large impact on, on real estate over time, because over any, any period of time, we do have major shocks, and whether that's natural disasters, whether it's wars, whether it's 9-11, COVID-19, uh, it has a big Im implications on real estate changes, behaviours, and uh, can also be um, factors such as uh, violence, in society, which, for example, in the US, changed the way people shop. They, they used to shop in the CBDs and they moved to the suburbs because of 
Um, there, there was a lot of crime and violence, which is maybe, maybe coming back. Um, so they, these changes have always been around and they're very hard to, uh, to predict and they're very hard to plan for. Um, but what ultimately impacts the value of real estate in, in dealing in, in, a, in an ever-changing world is the, is the utility of real estate. And it's, it's generally those assets that have robust uh, utility, um, i.e. those that best can, can deal with change that are the most valuable. And what, what is that? Uh, well, it's assets that are typically well located um, and they're, they're, therefore they're less likely to suffer um, valuation drops with changes in consumer behaviours such as um, change infrastructure, rail, roads, etc. Um, they're, they're, they're more uh, adaptable to, to change. Um, and it's, and it di it's different for different types of real estate, obviously, because well located can mean many things. Um, it may, if, if you have a very busy road that becomes very busy over time, it might be very valuable to own a, a service station on that road, but it may not be very valuable to own a house on that road. So they have to be suitable for, for the area in which they're well located. Rarity is a, a very important factor um, in any asset class, any investment rarity. Um, how, many, how many opportunities are there for people to buy something? If you live on a waterfront, um, um, in Sydney, you've got great, great views. That's going to be more valuable than living uh, in a suburban block somewhere um, out in the middle of nowhere, uh, which there might be many hundreds of thousands of, of, of those types of blocks. Um, and, and finally, I think we would just come back to adaptability. How, how adaptable is the real estate um, to, to changes? How, how flexible um, is its location? Um, it, is it something that um, can be adversely impacted um, over time? And an example might be, you might have a historic building on a very well located piece of land, but because it's a historic building, it's not adaptable to changes in technology. You can't knock it down, you can't, you can't change it. So adaptability is important. Um, so now just try and bring that in, into 2020 um, and COVID-19 and, and how, how will COVID-19 impact real estate values from, from my perspective? Um, I think that the biggest and most interesting thing is change to, changes to consumer behaviour. And it's, it's probably worth noting that I believe it's far too early uh, to predict uh, what the changes in consumer behaviour will be and therefore what impact will have on real estate values today. Many people will try and predict, and I've, I've said many times in the, in the last uh, few months, one thing COVID-19 has been really good at is making people who make predictions look pretty stupid. Um, and most people don't need much help to look stupid, so, but it's done a great job. And you know, some, of the, some of the predictions people have made, I've, I've heard over the last um, number of months, uh, for example, no one is going to drive cars anymore. So if you own a car park or a service station, you're in trouble. Um, the next month, the roads are busier than ever because no one wanted to travel on public transport. Um, so, so no, that's no longer a, that's no longer a, a problem. Uh, in Manhattan, for example, a one percent decline in the use of public transport leads to a twelve percent increase in traffic. So that's that's a cl classic example of where, as things have progressed, people have changed their views of what the impact would be. People have said people, people will no longer go to shopping centres. We own a lot of shopping centres. I can tell you, foot traffic in most of them is is almost back to normal. But it's it's, um, it's too if, if there's a flare up, that will change. But um, almost back to normal. Um, there have been predictions that everybody will move to the country. Um, that may or may not happen. Um, people will work for home, from home, office space is doomed. Um, there there won't, won't be people wanting to go to work. Well, I'm sitting in an office now. Um, I can tell you in 1996, the workspace ratio across Australia was one person per 25 square metres of office space. By 2012, uh, that ratio had fallen to one to 18, today it's one to 10. So we might see, maybe we'll see that ratio blow out. Do I think people will no longer go and work in offices? People are social creatures, no, I don't believe that. Um, I think they will, um, and I think the office the office market will um, be fine, but it's too, it's too early, it's too early to, to say for sure. Um, residential prices will fall by 30%, as uh, a headline that uh, the newspapers love love bringing out that it seems to fall by 30% every year. Um, therefore, it's worth negative something. 
Uh, it could fall, real estate price, residential real estate price could fall due to unemployment being higher, falls in migration, uh, people no longer wanting to live in apartments, time will tell. Um, all, all I'm saying is there are a lot of predictions made when there are when there are big shocks in the economy, they don't always come true. And, and 9-11, um, back in, in um, September 11, 2001, uh, was a good example um, where the predictions were that nobody would fly again, hotels were burned, 30% uh, of the office space in, in uh, Lower Manhattan was, was destroyed. Um, and today, if you, look, if you look forward 20 years, um, the population of people living and working in Manhattan, Lower Manhattan is 30%, um, sorry, is, is double what it was back in uh, the time of 9 11, and airports have survived. So a lot of, a lot of these shocks come along and they don't necessarily change things forever. Uh, what will change? Revenue for a lot of businesses will obviously be adversely impacted. They'll be offset by government stimulus. Balance sheets, probably the thing I think will change the most. Um, as people have tried to survive COVID-19, they've had to incur debt or, or uh, exhaust their reserves. That will cause stress and that includes the government. The government has incurred a lot of debt to stimulate the economy. They're going to have to recover that back. And that's, that's usually what ends up being uh, increased taxes. That's you and me paying it. Nations become less globalised. And I think there will be an acceleration in adoption of some technologies such as cashless payments, online shopping. Um, so that there will be changes, but, but what probably won't change, and that's probably most things. I think most people will revert to their previous behaviour. And I think we'll see that again, that, that as, as we move out of the, hopefully, um, the restrictions of COVID-19, a lot of things will return to normal. Um, and that, that I think, supports real estate prices. Low interest rates, I believe, will be here for a while, or the inflation is a risk. Um, but I think it's likely that things uh, revert uh, back to where they were to a large degree, although there will obviously be some dislocation in some areas. And that then leads me to what are the important skills for a property professional um, over the next 10, 20 years. And I think the most important skill is adaptability because things constantly change and you need, if you're going to be successful in a real estate career, you need to be adaptable. Um, and myself, Mark and Michael sitting on this call, um, none of us started our careers doing what we now do. Um, I used to work, for example, um, as a joke. Um, she started joking on Zoom, so you can't joke on Zoom. Um, well, she can joke on Zoom. <laughs> if you joke, you can't hear anyone laugh. Because it's not funny. Yeah. <laughs> That's a big coming for news, don't I? Uh, so I think adaptability is really important and trying to, trying to create expertise in areas that, that, that can't be overly um, disrupted. And, and by that I mean, I, and I hope there's not, there's not too many surveyors or any surveyors on this webinar. But surveying, for example, is an industry that clearly will get disrupted significantly by technology where once you used to have lots of surveyors coming out, doing lots of measurements and getting laser lights and wheels, and now, now you can send a drone up and it can do the job of a lot of people. So you want to be in areas where it's less likely to be disrupted. And with that, I will end. Thank you so much, Andrew. I mean, it's really lovely for you to really be stressing the fact that you can see technology and politics intertwining as, as you know, not just short-term shock disruptors, but things that have been building over a while, but you've emphasised the importance of place, adaptability, and, and not getting too excited about prediction in thinking about things. Now, I'm going to cross to Mark Steinert, who apparently is our expert on blacksmithing. So, Mark, you may wish to pick that up, or you may wish to just leave it where it lay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Marnie. You know, I might make Andrew a pair of uh, steel boots. Anyway, um, we'll, uh, I, what I might do after the, that brief history of mankind is perhaps just talk a little bit about um, the crisis and, and how we've responded to that. And, uh, and I'll make a few predictions. I'll get out there and have a go at that. Um, maybe before I do that as well, do just worth noting, so Stockland uh, is the largest residential developer in Australia, um, with top five in commercial property, got about 15 billion in assets, and uh, we're a top 50 ASX listed company. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners um, of the many lands 
across the nation on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And uh, similarly, just highlight um, the connection to place is critical for us um, as it is to the world's longest living culture and is central to our purpose of creating a better way to live through development. In terms of um, this year, you know, it was a year that actually started really strongly for, for our business. And then obviously COVID-19 came along and, and derailed um, a lot of that and, uh, and impacted most areas of our business. You know, I guess like most companies, our initial response was focused on safety um, of our people, our customers and stakeholders, um, cash preservation and staying open for business, you know, where possible. Our retail town centres and office assets in particular, you know, we're on the cutting edge of government restrictions and, and changes. Uh, we work very hard in particular on the shopping centres, the town centres, to keep them open and trading, um, working directly with the Prime Minister's office, the Treasurer, the Chief Medical Officers in government. Um, we're able to do that and uh, do that safely. We didn't have any community transfer in our centres, and I don't think any centres have, have, have been identified as that. We've actually led a lot of the initiatives for returning to safe operations. Um, at the same time, we're directly involved with the establishment of a code of conduct um, with the Treasurer and the Treasurer's Office, which was a way to define a framework for the sharing of the pain of the crisis, and I think will be quite instrumental in seeing a lot of businesses um, get through this crisis and uh, and reopen successfully. And, and we've already seen plenty of evidence of that, as I'll touch on in a minute. Residential business was also impacted. Closure of sales centres was a big issue for us. Um, we had to move to appointment only. Uh, and we had to digitise the business to Andrew's point about technology. So uh, we had full digital representation of our house and land packages. Uh, flyovers using those drones that Andrew talked about. Um, and at the same time, uh, digitised a lot of the customer interactions using artificial intelligence to also look at where um, customers were more likely to transact so we could really focus our energies. And at the end of this process today, about 70 to 80 percent of our inquiry comes online and uh, you can now buy a Stockland house and land package entirely online without talking to a person or interacting with a human if that's what you want to do. On the retirement living business side, that obviously is the most vulnerable cohort and we had even more stringent um, safety, more stringent safety response there. i just say about the response, you know, the operational response uh, was significant. And as I mentioned, working directly with government and stakeholders to achieve that. Um, our pandemic working group um, drove a lot of that day to day. Um, that was established immediately. Um, we had uh, practiced as one of our business continuity planning crises, um, pandemics. So um, we were able to follow that and, and get things going pretty quickly. And the business really just focused on what it could do um, with an absolute focus on safety and cash. And uh, I guess a couple of things that were relevant for us. Um, the executives started meeting every day, the board started meeting every week, and, uh, and, and that enabled a very agile um, response you know, across the business, which was um, pretty integral. I guess um, that brings us to today, and I think what's really important is the government response to this, as well as business response. Um, job keeper, job seeker, and other fiscal um, and monetary measures are worth about 125 billion. It's about 13% of GDP. It's one of the highest stimuluses in the world. Uh, and that covers about half of total economic activity in Australia for about four months. So it does set the economy up um, quite well, provided we can reopen it safely and, and avoid this cliff that everybody keeps talking about when JobKeeper ends in September. Um, we're, as a business, we're clearly focused on recovery and setting up for growth in the new normal. Um, and we believe that we are well positioned with customer preferences that we think are shifting to towards value for money, um, family and a health focus. Um, these demand shifts are directly aligned with our strategy of uh, developing livable communities uh, with high amenity. And while we haven't changed our strategy 
post-crisis, we've accelerated, um, particularly around logistics, uh, upweighting to that segment. It's benefited from the growth in online and uh, has, has powered through. And we do think there will be a change in just-in-time supply chains and you'll see greater storage of inventory in Australia, which will be beneficial for that segment as well. And at the same time, uh, we think you'll see more advanced manufacturing. Um, about 95% of all pharmaceuticals in Australia is manufactured offshore at the moment. We almost ran out of Ventolin. Uh, so you're going to see pharmaceuticals increasingly manufactured onshore. You'll probably see the establishment of refinery capability. We've only got about six days of fuel in the country, um, which is not, not too good if we get attacked. So uh, I think you'll see more of that. Um, those things will also be helpful for, for logistics and, and industrial. We want to grow our communities market share counter cyclically. Um, there's not a lot of distress at the moment, but there is some, some reasonable buying um, and complete the repositioning of our town centres towards non-discretionary. Um, discretionary is really where the biggest impact has been felt, um, particularly from online. And, and the last piece of that is creating a digital ecosystem around our business, um, which I think is the great opportunity for, for real estate to unlock the full value of um, such a capital intensive asset class. Um, the last thing I'll say, just looking quickly where we are today. So residential inquiries um, are actually back above pre-crisis levels. Um, and we're getting good conversion to sales and uh, settlement volumes are actually tracking quite well. Um, and there's a lot of things driving that. This um, home builder is a big deal for us, but even before that we saw an improvement to, to at least um, crisis levels. And that was because our customers, 73% of them are in industries that are positively or neutrally affected by the crisis. Um, we're very much about middle Australia and affordable product and, and that's resonated. Since Home Builder, um, we've seen inquiry levels triple um, from the average of 19. So, and that's a really big deal, that, um, that particular uh, stimulus in our view. Um, bearing in mind that housing um, represents a, a $6 trillion asset class in Australia. Um, the building of around 180,000 homes a year contributes over 100 billion of, uh, of GDP and employs about 500,000 people. So getting that sector going with that stimulus is, is really positive. Um, as Andrew described with the town centres, they've also opened up quite rapidly. So at the bottom by income, about 60% of our centres were open. Sitting here today, it's sitting at about 92 to 95%. And foot traffic now is only down about 15%. Uh, so uh, with that, I will stop and hand it back to Marnie to introduce Michael. Thank you very much, Mark. Really emphasising, I think that's uh, been a fracture point for a number of us working across a range of services and industries, the, the fracturing of the just-in-time economy and sovereign capability and supply chain assuredness has been a really big issue for us, not just uh, within the nation, but in the Indo-Pacific region as well. So thanks for, for drawing that up, but also providing people some reassurance around those residential uh, assets, which as you note, are a really significant part of the Australian uh, asset class. I'm gonna go now to Michael. Lovely to see you there, Michael, and a great uh, great view you've got there too. It's a little bit quiet here. There's normally about 15,000 people working in this complex. When I walked outside, it was about five, so it's a bit sad. But things will improve. Um, maybe I'll just kick off. I don't have any speeches like Fritz put together, but just the backdrop of Maple Tree. Um, we're not that well known. Um, in terms of our ownership, we're owned by Tamasic. And Tamasic is the Singapore government investment arm, which is ultimately the Ministry of Finance. So we're 100% owned by Tamasic, which is not GIC. Most people know GIC. GIC is the sovereign wealth fund of Singapore. Tamasic's the holding company. So we don't give them they don't give us any money. So for the last sort of 20 years of our existence, um, we've paid a lot of dividends back to our parent, but there's been no money back to us. So we've had to rely on our own ability to grow our business and recycle our capital. Um, we started with a couple of billion dollars of land in Singapore in the early 2000s, um, including the land I'm sitting on now. Um, and at last count, we've got about $60 billion of real estate, initially across Singapore and then across Asia and then across the world. Um, from about 2016, 17, when I joined Maple Tree, there was a intention, a strong intention to deploy outside of Asia and be a more global business. Um, so I guess from a COVID perspective, I've got a pretty interesting sort of global purview as to the impacts that we're seeing 
across geographies and across asset classes. Um, we've deployed about $18 billion now across UK, Europe, and the US. Um, we've got about 300 properties in the US and 100 across Europe. Um, we're quite thematic, so the sectors, and we're quite fortunate in some cases and less fortunate in others, but we've been focused on data centers. We own a lot of data centers in the US, and that's been incredible. I mean, that's probably the safest asset class that you'd want to invest in right now. We've had zero vacancies. All the tenants have been very happy to pay us rent. Um, the hyperscale assets we own in North Virginia with Google and Facebook, I think if they could get more space right now, they'd take it. Um, so it's just a great asset class. So very lucky there. We bought a lot of logistics across the world, um, bought four or five billion dollars of warehouses, 300 warehouses across Europe and the UK uh, and the US. That's been a phenomenal business, as Mark mentioned, you know, the supply chain reconfiguration, e-commerce, etc. Um, and COVID has been a, we've been a beneficiary of that. In Europe, we had, when we bought those assets in 1819, we had about 88% occupancy. That's up to 98% now. And we've leased more space in Europe in the last three months than we did all of last year. Um, and there's examples like in Gdansk in Poland, we had a, a warehouse that was empty for a long time. There was a retailer, a Polish retailer, who couldn't put stock on the floor because his shops were closed. And he was getting charged a lot of money by having cargo at the port. And it was cheaper for him to lease our warehouse than to keep paying the port. Um, it's a short-term lease, but there's no discussion to that extent that. Um, Columbus, Ohio, in the US, we had a big vacancy. We were dealing with a three-party logistics operator for a long time, and it was delaying and delaying. COVID hit, we thought it wasn't going to happen. And then out of nowhere, FedEx came in and said, we want the space. And then there was a, a bidding war. We ended up getting quite a higher rent than we would have otherwise. So um, a property in France, in Sauvignon, was empty for 18 months. was probably our most challenging asset. Um, in February, Amazon came in and said, we'll take the whole building over the next 12 months and the space let up. So our global sort of logistics portfolio is 97, 98% occupancy now. And that gives us an opportunity to start playing with rent when we're at that type of occupancy. So um, on the commercial side, we've also been fortunate. We haven't bought downtown office buildings. Um, we bought one in Minneapolis, which wasn't such a good idea over recent months. Um, but other than that, most of our properties are suburban office or sort of campus style business parks. So we have a big one in Reading, just out of London. Um, and we've been having a lot of interesting inquiry from London based tenants who don't particularly want to have their staff or are thinking about having their staff taking public transport. People live a long way out of London and have to travel long distances in public transport. They don't particularly want to go to a high rise building and have to deal with the problems of vertical transportation. So therefore, a low-rise, 70-acre business park, five levels, lots of car parking so people can drive to work rather than take public transport is more appealing. So, um, so those have been good sectors. Um, student housing has been less good for us this year. So we started acquiring a lot of student housing in the UK and Canada and the US. And that's been a great business and we're still a long-term believer. But obviously, this year, it's been very tough. And I guess the structural implications are, is e-learning going to really be a thing or do students want to be on campus? Um, and what we're seeing on an almost daily basis is that more and more universities in the US and more campuses are opening up in September, post the summer break. So hopefully that, that business comes back. Um, we also have a corporate housing business, which is our sort of main lodging business, which is not a five-star hotel business, which is good. So the cost ratios tend to be a bit lower, but that's also had, had some difficulties, obviously, over recent months. Um, so generally, depending on the asset classes that you're in, I feel quite confident with the decisions we've made. Um, we own a couple of outside of Europe and the US. We own the biggest mall in Singapore and in Hong Kong. Um, there are only two retail plays, but they, since Hong Kong has opened, it's been you know similar to what Mark said. We've had great occupancies, great foot traffic. People don't seem to be wanting to linger in the shopping mall, they, but they want to go in and they want to, they know what they want to buy and then they, they leave pretty quickly. Um, we've got a big business in China and in the last couple of months, that whole economy has really opened up. Domestic travel is everyone working very hard. All of the offices that we have across China are open now. Um, business is back to normal. Um, Vietnam has also been a great market. They didn't seem to suffer as much as other countries. Um, and we've got quite a big exposure there and that's been a great, a great place to do business. So, um, down in Australia, we own a bunch of office buildings which we syndicated last year, um, including 11 Waymouth Street in Adelaide, which we acquired and put into a fund. And that's been performing great. The Adelaide asset has been fantastic for us. So we are big advocates of doing more in Adelaide. 
That's great, Michael. I mean, you've really emphasised, I think it's come out more or less in all of your, your discussions here, the, the kind of geoeconomics of the situation. So Andrew there talked about location and it's actually being pressed in and thinking about a good location that could work for supply chain, but also, uh, you know, being adaptable. So having a, a mixed portfolio there and saying, you know, the supply chain side and the asset class that are looking after, you know, the, the cluster farms and IT farms up some of the slack that you'd expect from a traditionally well-performing student accommodation portfolio. That's always had a really good IIR. This has been a big shock to the system, but the diversity of the portfolio helps to capture that, but also the diversity of the location of the assets protects you against people that don't want to get public transport, that people that want to shift locations because one country's seen as safer and, and other countries seen less safe. So thank you very much for all three of you contributing really amazing wisdom. It works so well together. The three of you have commented in quite different ways, but they've locked together nicely. And one thing that it, it has come up through our questioning forum, and it's a really interesting one, is whether the shocks we're seeing in the system mean a, a backward knock on uh, green construction, green property, green technology. So whether, you know, the, the shocks in the system mean that people are just going to build things rapid and ready and do shovel ready work uh, and then might be an expediency around the green side of things. Do you see that COVID-19 could have impacted any gains that would have been in, in green construction in particular? And that's a question from our audience. So I'll open it up to any of you to answer. I don't, I think um, it'll reinforce Green, personally, I mean, Michael can talk a little bit about some of the investor requirements, but um, particularly European funds have been very focused on sustainability. And I think, if anything, you know, you can now add land, you know, pandemic, obviously, to a well understood crisis, you know, sustainability of assets, future proofing them to things like rising sea levels and, um, you know, tornadoes and earthquakes and things like that are, are absolutely um, central. And this will only emphasise that. I would say something like a well rating that looks at air quality and, you know, I guess the workability of the space and thinking about the future of work and social distancing and being able to, you know, future proof in your business continuity for pandemics um, all plays really strongly to that. And I would say the idea of um, people thinking about health and well-being through this and sense of family, a little bit of more grassroots thinking, also, I think, comes back to manufacturing or building techniques. So I can see things like cross-laminated timber and other elements like that becoming um, more utilised as a result of, of this, particularly given they're carbon positive and, uh, and the whole idea of being able to improve your carbon footprint is pretty central to you know, the investment process um, around the world. And with more money being allocated to real estate, from those types of managers, I think that only further emphasises it. Good, thanks. Uh, Michael or Andrew, Michael. Yeah, I, I think the health and safety aspect that Mark mentioned, um, you know, we're, we're going through it ourselves. We're, we're built, refurbishing one of our buildings in the UK and we've stopped because we know now that health and safety is going to be such an important factor. Um, you know, hands-free toilets and deliveries, the deliveries go through one entrance only. Is there a central point in the foyer that you do deliveries from, vertical transportation? Um, there's just so many things that I think are structurally going to change the way an office looks, which will be a landlord cost. Mm -hmm. But I think it will eventually be a rental determinant. You know, maybe there'll be a health and safety standard alongside the green standards, because if you don't have these particular features, then you're not going to get tenants to pay the rent. Yeah. Um, and I think there's going to be sort of an innovation race where everyone's going to be looking at what everyone else is doing in terms of health and safety around office buildings. Yep. and ensuring that, you know, the occupiers look after their employees. So that's incumbent on the landlords to make sure that happens. Yeah. And what about you, Andrew? Well, it's not really... I drive a Tesla. That's about as far as I get. <laughs> um, Declaration there. <laughs> but I, I think a, a, lot of, a lot of green initiatives in, in construction are, are, are really um, regulatory and politically driven based on community expectations. So... I would think that it probably accelerates along with Mark's um, thinking because the government is going to try and stimulate the economies and try to encourage um, more, more spending on, on sustainability because uh, and it's not just sustainability, but it's also um, trying to make, uh, as Australia as a nation, for example, trying to make us more self-reliant. Um, so I think that has a big impact on, on, uh, on those sort of factors because uh, you take it, you know, having to having to manufacture a lot of things domestically and 
knowing what's in those in those products uh, of gases and all those sorts of things is pretty important. Too. There you go. Well, it, it does run, doesn't it, from supply chain right through to well-being. The notion of being able to source local plantations for for composite wood products for for new kinds of building, right through to that notion of well-being and not having any buttons to touch, Michael. It runs from sure. from the biggest supply chain issues right down to the tiny details. And vertical transport is really challenged. So uh, we've had issues here. We've had to open up the fire stairs because uh, you can only get one person in the elevator at a time. And with a building that's uh, 12 storeys, 13 storeys high, that's an extremely difficult challenge for people to do their work. So the day-to-day -day practicalities are on people's minds. I'm going to shift track now. You've uh, What's interesting is that you None of you said that you intended to be where you are. I think that's a pretty interesting observation through your career. You've been obviously open to opportunities, uh, thought about things, but you probably had to tough out some pretty tough moments as well. Um, I'm aware that we've got some students listening in, but also people that may be contemplating career changes as, as well at the moment. What advice would you give people about building a resilience through the cycles that you've experienced? And whether any of you can comment on previous shocks that you've been through, such as, for instance, the GFC, um, you know, there've been moments where things haven't gone so well. So what advice would you give to people around resilience through the kinds of shocks that we're seeing right now? Because all three of you will have navigated considerable shocks and, and uh, challenges uh, along the way. So, Andrew, I wonder if I can start with you on this one. Well, I've, I've had massive shocks in my career. I've, I've worked with both Mark and Michael, which I survived <laughs> both of those. <laughs> Still recovering. There's yeah. always one joker on the panel, isn't there? Well, that's, 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 that's where I got my I own credit to Andrew. <laughs> I don't know what was scary working, working with them or going to university with them. But, 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 scary. Um, look, I think first, first thing is uh, have, having good mentors uh, is very important because as, as you enter the workforce, have, um, working with people and particularly reporting to somebody who's had a lot of life experience, uh, Mark with his blacksmith shops. And, um, <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> Michael with his Google cluster farms. <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> say that. <laughs> but, but I think working with people who've had life experience, because we all, you know, in, in the workforce, you know, the reason adaptability is so important is because things never, never do stay the same, and it's very difficult to predict What's, what's around the corner. And I always, people always say you know, to me over the, over the years, what do you think the next GFC will be or the next Asian financial crisis or the next whatever? There's always a crisis, 9-11, COVID. You can, one thing I can guarantee you is you can never predict what they are and you can never predict when they're going to come. So um, I think you just have to be adaptable. You have to make sure that your, whether it's your business or yourself personally, your own personal financial circumstances and your, you know, your mental state, your family, that you, you, you're constantly managing risk and being aware that things can, the black swan event can come at you. Um, tomorrow you just don't know. And so you, the, the people who tend to get into trouble um, are those who um, extend themselves or they're just not ready for it. They haven't, they haven't thought through all the things that could go wrong, anything about what could go right. And over time, the great news is most things go right. Um, I'm an optimist and things generally go up in value, they don't go down. Uh, most people are good, some people aren't, but uh, you just have to be aware and practical and, and pragmatic that when things do change, you have to deal with it. And COVID-19 is a great example. Mark touched on it, Michael's touched on it. We've all dealt with it, I've got no doubt. I've been doing the AFL in particular as well as our business. Uh, when these things hit you, you have to be pragmatic. You've got to, you've got to be decisive and, and make decisions quickly. Um, and that means not panicking and having a cool head. Uh, that's good which... advice. Yeah, that's good advice. Mark, what about you? Advice for those who are experiencing this perhaps as their first major shock? Yeah. Yeah, look, I, I certainly agree strongly with Andrew's point about um, yeah, mentors and, and people who um, uh, you, know, you can learn from, and, and particularly nothing better than a brutally honest um, and frank and direct, um, highly experienced mentor. Um, I think you learn, learn the most from those, um, and Wombat was certainly in that category, as was Pagey and a few of our other... <laughs> Uh, lectures and heads of school, but they were, they were great, and many others. You know, for me, someone like Dr. Seat comes to mind. He was he was amazing. 
um, you know, David Dickinson, Preds actually, and Michael, you learn from all these people. Um, only being open to learning um, and being willing to accept um, the advice and act on it is a big, big deal. A lot of people just sort of nod their heads and don't listen. Um, <clears throat> I think you've got to really focus on what you can control. You know, sort of thinking about past crisis season, I guess been lucky enough to have lived through a few of them um, now, 1990 and the GFC being the ones that really stand out. I think this, this one, everyone says, by the way, just getting off track for a minute, that this is worse. You know, it's worse in terms of the metrics. It's, I don't think it's actually worse um, structurally. You know, they, they were triggered by overbuilding in assets, creating overcapacity in the economy and overstretched and broken financial systems. And that takes, uh, and you had a build up in unemployment that became very structural and embedded. Whereas this is quite different. This is a deliberate freezing of the demand and the supply side. And so I think there's a decent chance, as long as you can unfreeze it within a reasonable window, together with the stimulus and the focus that actually will come back to life. Um, it won't be, I'm not talking about here strong upside, but, but a constructive um, outlook rather than a collapse and a cliff, which everyone keeps talking about. Um, I think it's the first person I, I saw who really looked at this differently, who's, who's properly um, trained for this is Glenn Stevens in the Finney yesterday. He said exactly the same thing. And, and Glenn obviously does know his stuff and he's highly regarded. And I think He's someone people should be listening to, you know, particularly those who are deeply worried about the cliff that everyone keeps going on about. Um, also, you know, you've got to take action. That's critical. I think you've got to be realistic um, and also optimistic at the same time. Um, and you've got to plan for the worst and hope for the best. And remember, hope's not a strategy. And I think you can sort of put all that together and sort of maintain some sense of work-life balance. Um, not that I'm particularly fit, but try to try to stay fit as well as working hard. Um, you know, and, and remembering that it's not going to be your work colleagues that are with you when you die. It's going to be your family. So I think you know, focusing on things that really really matter, you know, through through long term and keeping that in perspective helps give you resilience and absolutely grew that idea of, of optimism overarching um, along with realism. Mm, good for you. Michael? Um, just in terms of the crises, this one doesn't feel as though it's similar at all to the GFC because there's so much liquidity around. I mean, in my mind, GFC was a real liquidity yep. sort of drain um, yep. and there was real desperation, there was real distress and people could take advantage of that if they had the capital. Whereas this one, given what the public purses are doing and the $3 trillion in the US and every other government throwing money around, it doesn't feel as though there's a liquidity crunch and therefore vendors are not moving on price. I was on a call last night trying to convince a US vendor to move on price and he just flatly refused. Where if this was 08, 09, he probably would have had more willingness to be a little bit more concessionary on price. So um, I do think it's quite different. I do think we will bounce back, but there'll be structural changes. But it's not a liquidity crisis like it was. And that doesn't feel as scary as it was in 08, 09, because we just didn't know what was going to happen to the major banks and the major companies across the world. Um, just in terms of personally, I have to take my hat off to these two gentlemen. Um, you know, Mark, when I was studying at the University of South Australia, I joined Jones Lang with a scholarship, met Mark. He said, come to Sydney. I went to Sydney. Um, he then said no to a job in Hong Kong, which I said, I'll take it. So I went to Hong Kong. Um, then he got me back to join UBS with Pridham back in 96, I think it was. So, you know, it's, I think the, the case in point there is be opportunistic, you know, be instinctive around when the opportunity presents itself and be really tenacious. You know, don't give up on, on an opportunity when it presents itself. That's great advice. Now, all three of you have talked in the way about um, resilience over time. So there's been a focus over history and navigating those hard knocks. Let's talk now about place. So here's a little factoid for you. So I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research. I look after all the research activities of the university. I'm conscious of how fortunate we've been that we've managed to keep our campus open to research. So albeit under social distancing, we've managed to keep our stuff going. And the research has gone from therapeutic research right through to logistics research. That's been really fortunate. But when I talk to my peers in Singapore, uh, the East Coast of Australia, the US, the UK, they have closed. So I want to talk about the fortunateness of place right now. So in some ways, Australia has come through this in quite remarkable fashion. It's a better rated system. 
Uh, as the Prime Minister yesterday said, that was probably the big thing to work through was the notion of federation. Australia seems to have navigated it very well and our cousins over the ditch in New Zealand seem to have navigated this pretty well. And unex, you know, unsurprisingly, a lot of people are now looking at Australia and saying, this looks like a pretty good destination. Uh, you know, I want to move here. I want to do business here. We're getting a lot of uptick in inquiries. So I want to get your thoughts about uh, destinations and place. Andrew, you opened with that in a way. Is COVID rewriting people's understandings of, of desirable places? And where might Australia and New Zealand find themselves at the end of this? or does it reset very quickly to the global north being the place where everybody wants to be? So I'll go to you first, Michael, because you did talk about Singapore and the asset class in the US. So how fortunate is Australia and New Zealand right now? And is this just a short-term fortune that we're looking at? I think it's very fortunate. I think it's, it's done an amazing job, both countries. Um, and there's so many industries that I think would have no choice globally. The film industry, I own a property in New Zealand and we've got a lot of interest with people staying there because when they come over from the US, because there's not really many places to film in the world right now, they need a quarantine for two weeks. So there's that, those type of dynamics of the longer that it extends, the longer it takes to find a vaccine, the longer for that type of content industry, as an example, to be able to start filming again in California and in the UK, the more that Australia, Sydney, New Zealand are going to benefit. So I think there's real opportunities that are quite micro that could be quite significant the longer it takes for the rest of the world to come through. So. Um, you know, hopefully the air bridges and maybe Singapore becomes part of that at some point between countries where we don't have to quarantine. I think it's the longest period of time that I've stayed in one place for a long time. Um, it's hard to do business, it's hard to do foreign direct investment unless you can get on a plane and be face to face. So hopefully those opportunities where if Singapore could link up with Australia and New Zealand and there could be other forms of capital coming from Asia that direct themselves down, down south. Yeah, good, thank you. Andrew, what do you think? Well, I think Australia is better than New Zealand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Michael, Michael's going to put up the number that, and the web address is Airbnb. They got interested. Um, look, I, I think Australia always is a is a great place, and it it does benefit from being obviously being a, an island. Our, our remoteness is is both a a, a great asset, and it's also a at times it can be a negative, but I think what you've seen in Australia, is the response largely to COVID-19 has been regulatory driven and politically driven. And, and, and I think you've seen a, a really good performance by government to, to deal with the issues, to, to put the appropriate amount of support into the, into the system. Um, but you've seen that globally, so it's not, that's not uniquely Australian, but what, what we do have an advantage with one, much easier to close our borders, um, which given the particular nature of this, this crisis, that's a fundamental point. Um, COVID-19 can't swim, I'm told. So that's been, a, that, that's been a real big advantage. But I think you've also seen just structurally in our system, our political system, um, it, it's, we're, we're smaller, more, more agile than the US, for example, where they have a much more uh, complex um, economy and complex political system we are, but it doesn't mean we're perfect. You're seeing in Australia uh, where the states and the federal government haven't been completely aligned on a lot of things, and that has caused a lot of issues and still is and will continue to with borders closed, example. New Zealand doesn't have that problem. Singapore doesn't have that problem. Um, so I think it's, you know, uh, all, all advantages and disadvantages, a lot of it's just luck. Um, but I think we also have a very good system. What about you, Mike? Yeah, look, I agree with everything that's been said. I don't know if it's true, but I heard one of the things that helped with our luck was the bushfires. So we had a lot of tourists that would normally come down that didn't, um, so that helped limit the, um, the rate of uh, initial infection. But I agree as well with the, what's been said about how well the government's handled it. And I think how well the broad, most of the communities handled it as well, you know, observing social distancing and, and you know, getting on the front foot with that. Um, is a big deal. I think that um, these shifts uh, will um, will hold. You know, back to my point about the shifting value set. I'm, I'm not saying that we're going to entirely reset, but there'll be a degree of that, and this will stay with people for a long time. So certainly, you know, you're thinking about um, where you might invest or where you might want to live. I, I think Australia and New Zealand are definitely going to feature up there um, on the list. 
but, but similarly, I think Australia's response is really exciting. I mean, we've, we've been bogged down in red tape and bureaucracy for so long. There is no doubt that Australia had a really bad case of Dutch disease, in my view, after 26 years of uninterrupted growth, we've gotten entitled and lazy, quite frankly. And so this cabinet formation, I think, is great because it's finally starting to cut through a lot of those issues and look for, you know, this is about Australia competing with the rest of the world. And that got lost, I think, in the in that case of Dutch disease. So now Cabinet is clearly able to come together, have a sensible conversation, make a decision and change something. And the, I think there is billions of dollars of opportunity in, you know, within that. And similarly, as you said, there is a real list. I know we're very involved with the Aerotropolis here, the second airport and there's more than 30 multinational companies that want to come in and establish advanced manufacturing and you know very high end activities and they're still talking and they're still doing their work um which is to think that's happening in the middle of a crisis i think is quite you know quite incredible you know we've got a 500 million dollar development plan the macquarie park which is all about you know pharma it's about um, data centres is about technology. It's about um, you know, well-being and government. And once again, that's growing. In those and you can see clearly strong demand from tenants even in the middle of a crisis. So I, I see great opportunity by getting out of our own way and taking our best practices. I think the fact that there will be more advanced manufacturing is important as well because that will create jobs for future generations, smart jobs and. You know, that's really important and I think it can be a competitive advantage for us. I mean, there's so many things that Australia and probably New Zealand have invented that's just gone overseas and been lost. This is the opportunity for universities and CSIRO and business like Cabinet is to get together and capitalise and monetise these opportunities. Don't do what we've normally done, which is squander those opportunities. So, um, yeah, I think we'll see plenty of capital coming down. I see plenty of opportunity. Mm. Well, great segue into a question around the kinds of asset classes you've got across property. You've already mentioned just how enormous the residential asset class is for Australia. Is, is this an opportunity in a way for, for there to be a little bit more rebalancing? You've talked about advanced manufacturing. So is there an opportunity for there to be a strengthening of those kinds of property classes? So I'll start with you, Mark, uh, or whether it's just going to bounce back again to a just-in-time economy. So how optimistic are we that we can actually get to a slightly different mix of assets out of the other side of this? Yeah, I, would, I probably said it, so I'll be short. I'm very optimistic about that. You know, I, I think it's real. Um, and I think you, you'll certainly see more data centres, to Michael's point. You know, there's no doubt that um, everything going into the cloud and as, as more and more companies seek to attach a, a digital interface with customers to whatever their physical online product is and then you start to connect uh, you know a, an ecosystem around that where you can recognize the incremental value added and solving problems for customers and also monetize that you know only dramatically drives the requirements for computing power as does obviously things like AI and autonomous vehicles I mean these all things are very data hungry 5g you know, mega data sets, data lakes. So, I, you know, I think that's going to continue to become a feature and we'll see more and more of those types of assets, the advanced manufacturing as well for the reasons I've talked about. Um, I think there is one of the most stressed asset classes in Australia right now and probably around the world is, is retail or what we call mm. town centres. Mm. And working out how you can take the locational advantages of those assets. I mean, I think they will benefit at the margin because there will be, uh, there will be permanent um, flexibility built into every workflow now, I believe. I think most employees, where they can, will work at least a third of their time from home into the future. Um, I think the office is integral and, and will play a role in those social connections. And so I'm not calling the death of the office by any stretch. But think about it, right now, most office space can't accommodate more than a third of the workforce with social distancing. And, you have the, and then you have the compounding issue of the constraints of public transport. So until you go to no social distancing like NZ, you've got that challenge. 
but people have got a taste now for remote working. They know that, that Zoom and things like that can work quite effectively. Not all the time, but, but certainly some of the time. And that we will see, even if, even if it's at the margin, more people in the metropolitan area and the suburbs. And that's, that's actually the first positive thing that's happened for the town centres. The other thing that's positive for them, if we can work it out, is no online, either omni-channel or full online format was able to cope with the increase in demand. And even most of those that had had explosive growth couldn't, you know, their margins were eroded because it's very expensive. Yep. And, you know, the big boxes in town centres pay about the same rent as logistics space. So, and now you, now you start to see technology introduced in these concepts of micro distribution centres that, that are about the size of a house that are yep. AI uh, enabled and robotic enabled. And if you can start to create a hub and spoke um, format, then that means that becomes a viable use. And when you think about the fact that 50 to 70% of all retail goods in Australia sit in stores, not in distribution centres, and the stores are within 10 kilometres of where people live, you can work out how to digitally connect that, that inventory to people and create a great customer outcome, but that's an opportunity. So um, I think that there will be solutions that will emerge and help to reposition that asset class, but it'll have to go away from the whole idea of traditional, and that's quite expensive and it's hard, but I think that will come. Mm -hmm. um, so they're probably the, the big things for me. And the last one is people's homes. I mean, clearly <laughs> they spend a lot more time at home than they have for a long time. And so that, we, that was what was driving. The, we, we were absolutely astounded at how strong demand was. We thought, you know, things were really going to go down. But um, and people wanted to upgrade or they wanted to downsize. People were, things like having your own home offices become really popular. And I saw in the Finney yesterday that every hour you work in your home, you can spend 80, you get 80, 80 cents tax deduction, which is great. Yep. So I'll be doing a bit more homeworking now. <laughs> but um, anyway, the, the idea that you've got some space and it's yours, and how does that operate? Even if you've got a, a small backyard, you've got somewhere for a barbecue or something, have a few mates over, a few friends, whatever. Yeah, these things are going to be even more important, I think. Good. Okay. Uh, Andrew, what do you think about the mix of asset class and the opportunity? Uh, look, I think ca capital always flows to the opportunities. So, um, There'll be as as the economy and, and market preferences change, uh, there'll be opportunities in logistics, for example, and money will flow to logistics, so there'll be more development. But um, every uh, we have an investment banking business. With, I talk to many clients, and everyone uh, has come to the realization that they're going to invest in logistics. Logistics, by the way, anyone that doesn't know, used to be called industrial, um, it's, but it's, it's worth about twenty percent more if it's called logistics. So. Anyway, go figure. Um, so everyone now wants to invest in logistics. Well, I can tell you what I think will happen is everyone will go and invest in logistics uh, pricing and will get very, very sharp. There'll be a lot more supply, and then we'll be sitting on a won't be a Zoom call because we some other new technology developed um, in, in five years' time, and they'll be saying, "I oh, remember the crash of the logistics uh, sector because there was too much supply and something else happened." So I think the, the world just moves, it's like a washing machine, and it goes in cycles. So I think, yes, there'll be changes, um, you know, changes to behaviour as I went through earlier. But I don't think, you know, I think ultimately most things change very slowly and, and consumer behaviours um, revert back to the normal life. And I can tell you, working from home, I, I, I was convinced, and of course everyone now wants an office in their home because um, you needed one during COVID, but COVID will go. We won't have COVID. And, you know, I, I used to be on conference calls, uh, even some television uh, interviews and things. And I can tell you, it, it's not ideal when the dog's barking, uh, when the gardener's blowing the leaves out <laughs> on your window, and the kids coming in saying, Can you drive me? Like, you know, get into the office as quickly as possible. That's why we're all sitting in offices now. So I, I think a lot will just. Things will move around, but it ends up the same. Residential, I like residential for one reason, uh, because everyone needs to live in a house and that's not going to get disrupted. Uh, so, Yeah, that's good wisdom there. Thank you. Michael? Yeah, I, I still like logistics because we've got so much I have to 
And it is yeah. a bit exaggerated. I love it too, don't get me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we never, we never would have heard he that just got there early, Andrew. Either. He got there early. <laughs> <laughs> I like pubs. Sure his, second, his second job was industrial. <laughs> yeah. Mummy, you mentioned just in time. I think there's a shift to just in case. Yep. Because I don't think governments or companies are going to risk having essential items not available or supply chains from China where they can't access. So potentially there may be more demand for warehousing space because people just you know, want to have more masks or more sanitizer or more healthcare type equipment in country rather than relying on a supply chain that's broken down. Um, the other, another area that we've been looking at is, and I mentioned this, but you know, content. Um, the Netflixes, Disney's, HBO's, yeah. and I think that last couple of months of the world has probably been the biggest use of Netflix than ever. Um, Netflix spent eighteen billion dollars a year on production, and they closed all their studios for the last mm. three months. So, you know, that type of opportunity, as I mentioned, for Australia, New Zealand, and locations is quite enormous because that's with five G and streaming and everything else. That's that's not going to reduce; it's only going to enhance. So, um, the asset classes that we like, to Crimson's point, cap rates have fallen so low. It's hard to find value, um, mm. so it's always sort of exploring what's the next opportunity, but before everybody else finds it as well. So. Mm. So let's go to the underlying infrastructure. The stuff that makes the place attractive is often the amenity, uh, the utilities that are associated with that. So, you know, great to have a great location, but if the data infrastructure is not good enough, uh, is this a bit of a wake-up call, um, you know, around the world in terms of people's provision of fundamental utilities, access to power, access to data, movement of data? What do you think about, you know, is that is any of that rewriting people's thinking about location? So, Andrew, what's your thinking about the fundamental utilities and amenity and amenity of location? <clears throat> well, I think I, I absolutely agree with that. I think that the uh, that those that were MBN skeptics, not many, um, as as I was sitting at my farm in in the Southern Islands trying to get to the internet to work and having to stand like this with a motor and. Uh, you know, it's it's critically important, and that's and that's why data centres, microcorporate data centres, and, and Mark's obviously going to build one shortly. So, probably do a deal. The blacksmithing well. shop out the back as well. He's going to diversify. Well, It'll be a mix. Mark. I will make you send you Mark. <laughs> <laughs> the IRR will be fabulous. It'll be a mixed-use development. That's what it'll be. <laughs> you made money building them, mate, not not buying them. Fantastic. <laughs> that's right. Google Farms now, according to mining, by the way. Google Farms. <laughs> yeah. They're great. But you know, I, I, I think that's fundamental because you know one thing that's that's an absolute certainty is that the use of technology and and data and all those sorts of things, power, the need for power, it's only going to get greater and and probably at a, at a pretty fast rate. So I think I think that is going to change things and is changing things um, very significantly. And I think one thing that COVID nineteen has shown us all, um, and I think the bushfires, Mark mentioned the same sort of thing. I was, I was heard the rural fire service talking, for example, that each state has different uh, in the in the uh, emergency service there's different frequencies on their um, walkie talkies, which means they couldn't if, if there was a fire if it got to the the board of bad luck everywhere on the other side because they couldn't tell you what's coming. Um, so I don't know why they use the mobile phone, probably because they weren't cell phones. So that's definitely something that's got to be huge investment in. Um, and, I, and I think that's a great challenge for Australia because we're such a big country with you know, a relatively small population, but there's got to be a lot of investment in that. Yeah, good stuff. Michael, what do you think? I echo Andrew. Um, you know, data centers, North Virginia, is we own a bunch of data centers there in the US. Um, it's no sort of coincidence that Washington DC, Pentagon, all the defense forces which created the internet, they have amazing power, they have the undersea cable which connects to Ireland. Um, and you basically have data center alley where that cable is in the backyard of all these data, and that's the cloud. You know, it's literally like going in and buying the cloud. And it's hard to see where that business, where there's a risk to that business over time, unless these companies are broken up and they get smaller, but the actual underlying demand for that is, is forever. Yeah, great. Mark, anything to add? Uh, only hospitals, you know, I think um, we'll see a much more strategic thinking about hospitals and, and medical centres and testing centres and all these other things. Yes, while the pandemic will go, as Andrew said, another one will probably come uh, at some point. And, the scary thing for Australia is on the original trajectory, we were going to run out of um, you know, hospital intensive care 
beds and ventilators, um, you know, reasonably early on. And the US obviously, you know, New York City did that for a period you know, to establish a field hospital in Central Park. Um, so, you know, in, in reality, I think the, the criticality of, of those capabilities and also the ability to manufacture um, protective equipment, um, the fact that we had health workers on the front line, not so much here, I guess, but we saw overseas who were having to you know, put their lives at risk and fight the disease and not even have um, masks or other basic protective equipment available to them, um, you know, is, is obviously a massive problem that, that cannot be tolerated um, in the future. So I think health uh, infrastructure uh, is going to be redefined and educational infrastructure as well. The fact that, you know, the University of uh, South Australia and, a lot of, and some others were able to go online, but so many weren't. Um, is, is obviously not acceptable. You can't have a situation where education stops um, or moves to a highly substandard um, level and creates you know, remarkable disadvantage and disruption to something as fundamental as learning. Um, so I think that uh, underlying infrastructure will also uh, change and obviously then that links into the digital piece that, that Andrew and Michael already talked about. Mm, that's really nice. And, and by the way, a nice shout out to anybody that's involved in the local manufacture of PPE, which has uh, sprang back up in South Australia and the three universities are providing joint testing to make sure that those are all assured for healthcare workers. So anybody out there listening who's got healthcare workers in the family, uh, thank you very much for all your, your hard work. Andrew, you were talking when you were using those examples of the uh, walkie-talkie frequencies, it just reminds you of railway gauges back at Federation, doesn't it? And uh, in fact, in September 11, one of the biggest issues found in the report was was the, the different radio frequencies meant that different emergency services couldn't talk to one another, uh, obviously on a, on a disastrous day. So it just reminds us that the simplest things can often be calamitous in terms of navigating through really big challenges. So in terms of, of navigating through to the future, Andrew, you said you're not prepared to predict. You said it's too difficult to do that. But of course, it's very difficult not to want to do that. Uh, and a reminder to our audience, if you've got any questions, you can post on the Q&A board. We've got one question there from David. He says the short term, under 24 month and long term effect on commercial properties uh, in particular. So, you know, any, any advice on commercial property? And Mark, you've mentioned retail. I think retail was struggling before. So if anybody wants to talk a little bit more re about retail or you just want to avoid it, that's okay. But it'd be nice to hear a little bit more on the short term on the commercial and any thoughts on retail while we're about it. <laughs> Andrew doesn't want to go near it. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Town, Andrew. You, mean, you mean town centres? Sorry, yeah, town centres, absolutely. Centers. Town centres, yep. And any comments on retail as well? That's come up. So any thoughts on retail? <clears throat> well, re I'll just mark, this is better than I do, but re retail um, is a catch-all for, it, it's a very big space. And I think people tend to, to throw all in one bucket and say, oh, retail's doomed because of, because of uh, online, well, the retail's not not doomed. There are parts as as retail has always adapted. Um, department stores have been um, going broke for forever. Um, if you go back to you know hundred years ago, there were probably more. I'm sure there would have been you know fifty or more household name department stores in Australia. Um, so that's that's a long term trend. Uh, trends change. Shopping centres have to adapt. Uh, some shopping centres. You know, one you know will struggle to adapt. Many will, will do well in, in during COVID. Um, you know, our, our clients and, and our assets, we've got some assets as well in uh, convenient, more convenient retail, for example. It's done incredibly well. Um, so it's it's a big space, very dangerous just to to generalise. Um, but there's you know there's clearly headwinds in in many sectors, and retail is one of them. Office, uh, you know, people talk about the, the risk that people won't go to offices. Well, you can probably guess, I, I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I think my biggest prediction would be that most predictions will be wrong. Um, you, can, you can almost guarantee that. And that change will be slower than people think. But Yeah, okay. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, well, I think the, I talked before about the, the repositioning of, of retail or town centres around around growth that's the opportunity for them and that will mean um, I think bigger health and well-being and medical precincts in them um, it will certainly 
it, we saw the role of the supermarkets and the discount department stores and um, you know technology and electronic stores and things like that obviously have done well through the crisis and are doing well before the crisis so I think you'd be safely sure they'll continue to do well but they'll become even more omni-channel um, mm -hmm. to be able to back to my point about digitizing the supply chain, even the micro supply chain, you know, of a center and the people that live around it. And whether that's click and, and collect or click and deliver, or you just come and do a traditional shop, those things I think become ubiquitous. Now people have talked about that for a, for a long time, but the talk, you know, is gone. It's now, it's been forced to become real and it's been incredible to see how quickly, a bit like this video conferencing, how quickly that has become real. And the pieces were there, but there was reasons not to not to go in, but now people have gone in and are finding that it's solving customer problems and, uh, you know, therefore, by definition, will have a, a longer serving purpose. I think as well, um, you know, Michael talked about people wanting to work uh, to some degree anyway, in an office environment, but not necessarily it always in the CBD. So I think a bit of hub and spoke in office use will also emerge and that's an opportunity because the town centres are quite well located for that kind of concept. And I would say vocational education as well. I think the universities that have got the best um, online offering who will maybe then work closely with TAFE um, to create um, micro-credentials to enable people to actually learn to and go into a job. And I think IBM have pioneered this and done it in about 144 different countries. But it's clear that the disruption of COVID is a lot of people are going to have to retool and, and repurpose. And they're not going to be able to wait to do a four-year degree, but they might do, you know, a year, half the units in, in for the uni and half in... TAFE and know that they've got a job and they can get all that sorted out and then, but then have continuous learning once they go into the new role and the micro-credentialing that's highly targeted gets them into that. So I see an opportunity for, for that as well because you need that close to people and if you can use the agility then you can scale. Once again, that's digi creating a digital ecosystem around tertiary and vocational education. And so anyway, th those are the changes that will make it sustainable but there is a cost to that and in the transition. So I think you will see the most value adjustment in retail. Typically what we hear is you know, somewhere around 10%. We've seen negative 10 and we've seen uh, you know, a number of valuations actually published around that sort of number. People say a lot more. I don't know there is a lot more if you really have rebased your rents and the, and the yep. occupancy costs yep. are sustainable. I think logistics, as we've already talked about, hasn't really changed and in fact will go up in value, not, not go down. And an office will probably oscillate in the middle. Um, I don't see great vulnerability there, although there will be an increase in sublease space for a period, yep. I think. Um, yep. and that might dampen, um, particularly if you've got a market that's not undersupplied, but most of the CBD markets right now are equilibrium or undersupplied. Yep, and Michael, retail, commercial. Yeah, just on from an investing perspective, um, it's possible that office cap rates shrink. And the thesis there is that it will fall because the point I made earlier about there's just so much liquidity. The interest rates are going to be lower for longer. Um, at the moment, you can go into Europe and borrow 50, 60% loan to value at 1.5% euro cost, 3% for US dollars. If you can buy a 5 to 6 yielding cap rate asset and get a 2, 3, 4% positive carry, that sort of looks like Japan then, because people have just sort of been buying real estate in Japan for many years just to take the carry between the cost of that. So it's, you know, there's some structural, you know, is there going to be less people having more space per person, et cetera, which we need to sort of get through. But there's probably more certainty that office will continue to work versus retail. There's still some just uncertainty around individual retail locations, et cetera. Um, so if you believe in the office story and you believe in the quality of the covenant and interest rates continue to stay as low as they are as a, relative asset class taking that type of positive carry is pretty compelling. So, you know, maybe more capital flows there, cap rates go down, values go up. So. Yep. Okay. 
Yep. And of course, if you're a, an active wear or leisure wear producer at the moment, that kind of retail is booming right now. As long as you've got, you know, you're using omni-channel, you're getting your stuff out there, you're probably doing pretty well. You've just mentioned um, interest rates there, Michael, and, you know, somebody's 0% interest rate is uh, fortunate for somebody, but it's misfortune for somebody else there too. So if the interest rates stay as low as they are, uh, you know, that's good for some folks and it's not good for other folks. Do you think it's going to remain sluggish or do you think that we're going to see some pick up in future? What do you think? The banker? Well, we have, we have actually got an incredible business. Um, interest rates, this, this, is the, this is the trillion dollar question um, mm -hmm. that, that, that I think the, the global economy faces and, I, and this will impact everything. And I don't know the answer and I've read an enormous amount on it. And that is, will we have inflation? Because there are there are many schools of thought. So um, Paul Tudor Jones, if you want to Google him, wrote wrote a paper um, I think overnight or very recently, um, saying that inflation is going to come. And a lot of people talk about hyperinflation coming. Um, many, many people happen because interest rates are low. The Reserve Bank in Australia has said interest rates will stay very low um, for the next two and a half years. The, the U.S. the Fed saying it. Um, but again. Very difficult time to make predictions and it's very hard to know. So I, I don't know whether we're going to have lots of inflation. If we have lots of inflation, interest rates going up. Um, very hard to know. But one thing we are going to see um, is with the banks, and this, this, this will impact directly in real estate, the banks are going to increase their, uh, the, the credit spreads, the margins. So even if, even if the underlying rate is lower, the cost of borrowing may go up um, slightly because of the credit spreads and they're probably also going to, well they're probably they are doing it and this will continue, they're going to change their um, credit requirements. So they're actually going to charge you more in terms of the credit spread and they're going to lend you less. That's, that's a simple way of looking at that. Um, and that is going to happen and that will that will have impacts on, on the real estate markets. Difficult to know quite what because as Michael said, he's, he's exactly right. There's so much liquidity out there, there's so much capital international and domestic looking to invest and chasing you um, that that might counteract that but you know we're going to we're going to see a changing world and um, inflation is going to be the big one to watch mm. well that's it and it's, and it's difficult to predict i'm going to round it out very shortly but uh, affordability is something that uh, is the flip side of that so access to the residential market in particular mark the prices may go down but you're seeing a, a, a big jump in demand for things, um, you know, does housing become unaffordable for lots of people or does it mean that we need more experiments in, in residential classes of, of property development to make it accessible for people? Yeah, it's, it's a good question and it's a complex one because, you know, really if you look at the proximity to the CBDs and you, you think about what you can buy in Australia um, versus many other places in the world, um, it looks remarkably affordable, to be honest. Um, and also the infrastructure changes that have been put in place in the last 10 years, or not even 10 years, the last six years, which are probably the most profound in 50 years. You know, the new railway lines in Sydney and Melbourne in particular now mean that you can get into the city in 30 minutes, 35 minutes um, from the, what was the periphery of the metropolitan area, which is typically, you know, 35 k's out. And in those locations, you can buy a new home in Melbourne, four-bedroom home for $450,000 from Stockholm. You can do the same thing in Sydney for probably around $650,000, $700,000, which, um, as I said, in, in a global context for global gateway cities is incredible value. Uh, and then, of course, I don't think anyone would say that Adelaide... Um, Brisbane or Perth in a global context uh, are unaffordable either. Having said that, there is probably north of 300,000 families um, who are on social housing and affordable housing waiting lists. And so, um, you know, it's certainly something like Job Builder, $25,000 for a low income household, combined with the stamp duty waivers and state government rebates is a unique period in time. In Perth right now, you get a $69,000 rebate all up with, with um, Home Builder and everything else. And you can easily buy a high quality, um, you know, three bedroom home in Perth, brand new home within 20 minutes of the city for 300 grand. So 
you know, you're actually off to a pretty good start with, yeah, uh, with, okay. with all those incentives. So, and they've got Keystart, which means you can actually buy a home with a 1% deposit. So um, I think that will actually be quite a unique opportunity to, to solve in, a, in somewhere like WA. Hopefully at Cabinet, they talk about these things and they think about you know, replicating that system across the nation because that actually makes money for the government as well. And it's just the government using their balance sheet and, and with such a low cost of capital for them to do that is actually a, a very logical arbitrage. They can make money and get people into a, into a home. Um, and of course, so the other piece is that about a third of the land cost is government charges. So if the government is able to provide more, more certainty in the planning system and organise the planning changes with the delivery of enabling infrastructure, you can actually, without anyone having to give anything up, you can bring down the cost of housing. And of course, there, there's a bit of excess capacity in the system right now, so you can get good prices on builders, although that's probably going to change because of, um, of home builder, which just means people, more people are in work. Um, but I, I think you've got this unique window for a period that beyond that, it's going to be about using scarce resources more efficiently, you know, better planning, better aligned infrastructure delivery, cut out the red tape, take advantage of these low interest rates to create both ownership and long-term rental and use the existing land more intensively. I mean, our ratios of um, persons per square kilometre, you know, they're by far amongst the lowest in the world. So you've also got to be able to put the story to the broader community, the development can be good. And that means infrastructure contributions, it, rather than not being spent, which is quite often been the case around the country, needs to be spent and it needs to be spent on public infrastructure. It needs to be spent on upgrading schools, upgrading hospitals, upgrading parks, upgrading walking trails, bike riding trails. You need to create that better way to live, to build trust with the community that doing these things and, and addressing the structural affordability can actually be a win-win for everybody and it's in, in the nature of that idea of a circular economy. So I think that's part of you know, what I see as the opportunity in, in a nation where we're focused on solving problems and not you know, wasting time, you know, not being able to take decisions or understand you know, underlying fundamental macro and microeconomic and social issues. Yeah. That's extraordinary. Look, the, the questions are just beginning to come in. You know, they're all packing up there, but the, we're nearly out of our time. And, and what I want to do is round it out by just acknowledging that what you've really helped us to see, I think quite clearly, all three of you, is that, that property is both a diagnostic of and a driver of social and economic health. It really is allowing us to see what's going on across the sector, how the economy may shift in particular ways, Mark, through the opportunities you've talked about. But then, Andrew, understanding that the way that politics and liquidity can drive these things, and Michael, the opportunity, jumping on the opportunity ahead of the curve, being critical. It uh, really leads me to believe that, you know, the three of you are extraordinary property gurus. And uh, I use that word not lightly at all, because uh, what you've shown us today is an incredible virtuosity across a range of skills. Uh, you're, you're part future readers, although Andrew, you'd protest and say that you don't like to predict the future. I think all three of you have got an outstanding sense of timing in thinking about what the opportunity is. You've shown a really deep understanding of the disruptive power of technology prior to COVID. You've, you've talked about supply chain and notions of sovereignty and how things connect together, an understanding of different asset classes and the financial instruments that can either support or constrain the opportunities that go forward, government settings, notions of federalism, uh, politics. We haven't even really talked about the kind of social upheaval that's going on in the world, but I think it was sitting in the background in a lot of your discussions. So uh, all of this came from a property degree, which is pretty extraordinary um, that you had that opportunity, but it's life experience along the way. And I just want to congratulate all three of you and thank you so much for being so generous with your thoughts and wisdom. Um, I think the audience really has, um, with me, appreciates just how far ranging your thoughts and advice have been. And it really does drive home that, as I say, I think property is an extraordinary area for showing a, a skill set that, that goes from finance right through to the social sciences, through to politics. So congratulations, gentlemen. Good luck riding the rest of the wave. We hope to check in with you again. Uh, I guess if we check in with you three months time, and uh, Michael will be you're happily riding the wave on logistics. Andrew will be saying, no more building, no more building. And Mark will be able to report back on just how well that uh, those home renovations are going across Australia. But congratulations to all three of you. Good luck with the, uh, the weeks ahead. And thank you to every one of our uh, audience members 
who've joined us today. This has been an incredibly stimulating conversation and um, thank you again for your generosity. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Marlene. Appreciate it.